the reconstruction of Lower Manhattan after 9-11, whatever you want to say about it in totality, historic preservation has not been a major part of it. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Those are the three great questions of our lives. And monuments are a way to join that great spectrum of humanity. I hope that this memorial will say to America, well, you know, these people died because someone thought that it would start a race war. CBS presents How We Remember. On June 17, 2015, a 21-year-old white man named Dylan Roof entered Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina, and murdered nine black people as they prayed. Their pastor, the Reverend Clementa Pinckney, was among them. Five people survived. After his arrest, Roof told authorities he wanted to incite a race war. He was convicted and is now on death row. It's been three years since this unspeakable tragedy, and while the congregation remains resilient, the grief is still real. I think that the grieving process is different for each of us, and I would say probably for the survivors it will always be in their memories, very fresh on a daily basis, particularly if they lost loved ones actually during the tragedy. Dr. Maxine Smith is a lifelong member of the church. There are times when I'm really very sad about what happened. And there are times when if I'm at the church, it could be on an occasion where I'm stopping into the office to do something. And if there are visitors walking by, gawking, taking pictures, and if they engage me in conversation, I could very well end up crying just while they're there. So it, it surfaces at different times, sometimes when I'm not expecting it. While the church offers a message of forgiveness, not everyone believes Ruth is worthy of their mercy. I have no intentions of even thinking about it yet because uh, Reverend Pinkney was my friend. Willie Glee calls Mother Emmanuel his home. The other eight people I knew well, and I have no intention of forgiving someone who intentionally took their lives. We live in, in a racist, white supremacist society. It was created that way. And he was just a byproduct of what happens in this country every day. When I first became pastor, to be very honest, I wasn't sure how to lead this church. Bless him because he is worthy to be praised. Reverend Eric Manning became Mother Emanuel's pastor one year after the tragedy. But I think a lot of times people will look at forgiveness and they say, okay, that then excuses the behavior. No, it never does. Uh, it should basically say, I'm no longer going to allow the past tendencies to shackle me, so to speak, uh, and keep me from moving forward. So you forgive, you don't forget. The church's response to racism and white supremacy in the South has a long history. Founded in 1818, the congregation came together when free and enslaved African Americans left the white-dominated Methodist church over discriminatory worship practices. But they continued to be harassed by white authorities. In 1822, one of the church founders, Denmark Vesey, planned a slave rebellion when the plan was foiled, dozens were executed, 22 on the same day. Denmark Vesey was also executed. They were paraded around the city before they were taken to the gallows, not far from the church, which was called the Lines, now called Line Street, and they were all hung. It was quite a scene. The gallows were poorly prepared. Um, many of them were shot in the back of the head. This year, Mother Emanuel celebrated its 200th anniversary. It is the oldest African-American church in the South. We're supposed to be there for some reason. Look at the location of where we are on Calhoun Street, downtown Charleston. Gentrified, totally gentrified. But again, there has to be a reason for us to be there, given all of the horrible things that have happened including this most recent tragedy. 
In order to remember the lives of the Emmanuel Nine and the survivors, the congregation decided to create a memorial. Smith leads the Memorial Design Committee. If in our communities we can have some place where people can go because they know something happened there, that's better than them reading about it in a newspaper or a magazine that they put down and don't see again. So if there's some place for them to visit, if there's some things about that uh, memorial that will help them remember, I think that's important. The church awarded the design to New York-based architect Michael Arad. While I was still under consideration, I was invited to attend a service and it was a remarkable experience. Uh, and by the time that service concluded, I felt that this memorial is needed more by the rest of the world than it is by this community. There is so much strength and resiliency and hope and optimism that was manifested during the service. Arad is best known for his design of the National 9-11 Memorial in Lower Manhattan. We knew that if he could actually fill or meet the needs or the requests of 3,000 families, that hopefully he would find a way, even though he comes from a different background, uh, that he would be able to meet with the families of the victims, the survivors, and church members to kind of capture all of their thoughts. One thing that was very important for me was that sense of community that I saw, and not just in the aftermath of the attack, but along the 200 years of the history of this community, uh, of this congregation, um, and whether in slavery, whether in Jim Crow, the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and I think what gave people power to resist and to, not just to resist, but to, to be uplifted um, is a sense of belonging to something greater. On one side will be a memorial court. At the center is an oval-based fountain with the names of the nine parishioners who lost their lives inscribed along the edge. Two white marble benches encircle the courtyard. A survivor's garden is also planned. I think the memorial court is going to be a more somber, quiet place dedicated to memory, whereas the survivor's garden is a place where I imagine, uh, you know, kids running around, you know, impromptu gatherings uh, occurring there after church or uh, with groups of visitors meeting with members of the church to uh, learn about the history of what happened here. While the congregation still needs to raise an estimated $10 million for construction and upkeep, the need for a memorial, such as this one, is clear. We certainly want people to be able to go in and not be fearful. We want, to go in, want them to go in and feel comfortable, but we also want them to leave in a reflective mode so that they think about the work that needs to be done in this country about being kind to people regardless of who they are and the color of their skin. I want the memorial to be a reflective place where people will come and say, there was a horrible tragedy in that place that night, and it was based on the history of race in America, and we need to do something about that. So I want them to leave this place saying, I am going to do something about race in America. That's what I want to happen. Coming up. We are trying to figure out right now who we are as Americans. The death of nine black people by a white supremacist in South Carolina sparked a movement to remove Confederate symbols and statues from public spaces. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I'm trying to come down, sir. I'm going to comply. I promise you. I'm, I'm coming down. I'm prepared to be arrested. After removing a Confederate flag from the South Carolina State Capitol, 
Activist Bree Newsom was arrested and charged with defacing a monument. Not long after, then Governor Nikki Haley had the flag removed for good. It's a funny thing, when people encounter a monument or memorial in the landscape, they look at it and they think, wow, that was the way it was. And actually, I've come to find that it really, it's the tip of the iceberg. It's not really the way it was. It's the way a small group of individuals decided um, they were going to remember history. With over 1,500 Confederate statues in America, protests over the right to exist continue in the public square. What does the Confederacy symbolize for you? Uh, for the southern states to secede, uh, escaping Lincoln's mandatory taxes, which was moral tariffs. Uh, the war was not about slavery. I and a group of friends and people who care um, come out here every weekend. These guys have been out here every single weekend since Nikki Haley finally took that flag off of our state house dome that was put up there in 1961 in the height of the civil rights movement, 150 years after the Civil War. We can't dismiss a Confederate monument, to give an example, as being just a statue. Imagine you are a citizen of this country, you're African-American, and every day you have to walk by, drive by, see a symbol of slavery. I think the best monuments inspire us to live more fully, more consciously, more generously, with the understanding that all of us are capable of so much more than we think. They're redemptive. Michael Arad is designer of the 9-11 memorial with landscape architect Peter Walker. I think there are some memorials which probably should come down, but I think we should be very deliberate about that process because erasure is a form of memory loss too. And I think losing a memory of a violent and unjust past is troubling. Arad was 35 when he won the national competition for a design called Reflecting Absence. It was a collaborative process that would take eight years to complete. You know, if we would have walked in on day one with a design that was executed at the 9-11 memorial, it would have been rejected. It had to come out of a process of engaging multiple constituencies, multiple people, of having of people having a sense of agency over the design. It makes the design better. I don't think that one single mind can sort of, can do all of that. It is the only place in the world that does double duty as a commemorative sanctuary and as a commercial development. 16 acres, half dedicated to the memorial, half dedicated to various skyscrapers. And it's an unlikely mix, but it really does work together wonderfully. Because here we are, full of life, working, visiting, looking at people and art, and we are also grieving. And that's how life is, you know? Grief and joy are not separated. They're always, they always walk hand in hand. How we remember our shared history through memorials is always changing. Iconic monuments like the Statue of Liberty is no exception. The Statue of Liberty is, I would say, the American icon. She is a symbol of freedom. She is literally incomparable. She stands in the harbor away, she's two miles away from Manhattan skyscrapers, she will never lose her scale, which is an important thing. She'll always be majestic. Lady Liberty was a gift of friendship from the French in 1886. She is known originally as liberty enlightening the world. So it's not just freedom and democracy, it is 
the wisdom to pursue freedom and democracy. At the turn of the 19th century, new immigrants sailed past the 305-foot statue on their way to a new life in America. That image of liberty is literally standing for everything that we stand for as a country, very particularly our welcoming those who might not look like us, might not sound like us, but who are us. This is a nation of immigrants. So liberty has become only more important in recent years. On July 4th, 2018, activist Patricia Okumu scaled the Statue of Liberty protesting the Trump administration's immigration policies at the U.S. border. And what you could see from a distance was this tiny figure of this female protester, a woman on her hands and knees crawling around the base of Liberty's skirts. And from a distance, she looked like a tiny child, a vulnerable child. It was such a powerful image because she has thrown herself, as so many people have, at Liberty's mercy, at the idea that this country is about something more than any one individual's needs, desires, or ambitions, that this is a community a family, a huge one. I was grateful that she reminded all of us about the meaning of the Statue of Liberty and that it's not just a statue from the 19th century. It is a symbol of what we as a nation believe in. Coming up. We've argued that this neighborhood is one of the most important neighborhoods in American immigration history, but yet it's almost completely destroyed. You got your multi-ethnicity with all the languages that I can't even identify. <laughs> Joe Svalak was born and raised in New York City. Today, he is a New York City tour guide. If you were looking up Washington Street, this Harper's Review drawing of the late 19th century shows it as the Middle Eastern neighborhood. I think it's wonderful. With the low-rise buildings, you can see from the corner it says, Syrian restaurant and lodgings. The son of Moravian immigrants, he is among a group of grassroots organizers who are working to preserve the last of a lost neighborhood in New York City. In this massive redevelopment, this rampant redevelopment down here, this is an island of tranquility, of three buildings that you see that have a human scale and a human story to tell each of them in their own way. For thousands of Arab immigrants new to America, it was considered the mother colony, but today it is affectionately known as Little Syria. When I started researching it, I didn't know that there was an Arab presence in the United States 100 years ago. Todd Fine is a historian and co-founder of Washington Street Historical Society. When you study Little Syria, you realize that you have this cohort of people who contributed a lot to the United States, who were involved in business, culture, and were deeply involved in the political and social scene of the United States. What's left of Little Syria can be seen here. Three buildings, side by side, in the shadow of One World Trade Center on Washington Street. And just by chance, you have three of them in a row that are very significant because you have a former church building, you have a community center, and you have one of the only remaining occupied tenements in Lower Manhattan still here. In the 1840s, immigrants from Europe began to arrive in America. Most were German and Irish. By the 1880s, they were joined by people from what is now Syria and Lebanon. They were coming to take advantage of what they thought was economic opportunity in the United States but they also came because of economic problems in the Middle East. Mary Ann Dinopoli is a genealogist and the daughter of Syrian and Lebanese immigrants. 
the price of silk had fallen because of competition with Japan, the price of tobacco had fallen because of competition with Egypt. And also beginning in 1909, they came because they came to escape conscription because the Ottomans were beginning to draft Christians into the army, which is something they had never done before. Speaking mostly Arabic, new arrivals took up peddling to make ends meet. I think some of them may have spoken English, but I would guess that for the majority they didn't, which is probably why peddling was a fairly easy business to get into, because they could show the merchandise and maybe be able to say what the prices were. So it was a very visual thing, rather than you know having to negotiate uh, contracts or something like that. Buildings like this community house were vital to assimilation. And it was here that they would learn to be new Americans. And the neo-colonial architecture was meant to inspire that. Little Syria was also home to a robust Arab literary movement. Among those who lived and worked here were novelist Khalil Gibran, author of The Prophet, and Amin Rouhani. Through the writings of Amin Rouhani, the Book of Khalid, which is the first Arab American novel which actually takes place in this neighborhood about two young men from Lebanon who immigrate to the United States and then out of their experience in New York in the United States return to the Middle East to start kind of a revolution against the Ottoman Empire but based on the idea that that all religions are one and that we can learn from each other spiritually. Coming to America meant the promise of freedom to worship as they wished. Catholic, Greek Orthodox, Protestant, Maronite and Melkite all lived and worshipped side by side. One of the few remaining houses of worship is St. George's on Washington Street. It served the Melkite community beginning in 1924. In 1929, they redid the church with this wonderful uh, neo-Gothic terracotta, beautiful with St. George and the dragon and all those representations, with all kinds of symbols of the grape leaves and the quatrefoil and everything right on it. Today, the building is landmarked, but now, it's a pub. Remnants of the diverse religious landscape continue to be revealed in unusual ways. After 9-11, they discovered a cornerstone of St. Joseph's Maronite Cathedral in the rubble of the World Trade Center. We don't really know what to make about that. If you're a spiritual person, you might, you might, there might have things that come to mind, but the main thing is that that is a physical remnant of the, the Arab history Lebanese and Syrian history in Lower Manhattan that means a lot to people. The remains are now on display at Our Lady of Lebanon Maronite Cathedral in Brooklyn. A recently discovered article from The Sun, written in 1912, reported the existence of a Muslim prayer room on the third floor of a building on Rector Street. For a long time, people considered this little Syria to be a Christian neighborhood. And if there were Muslims, people assumed that it was very marginal, only a handful or, or just a couple. And now historians are, are going back to reconstruct the Muslim presence in this neighborhood and throughout the city that would have been centered right there in Lower Manhattan. More than 27 million people entered the United States between 1880 and 1930. The Immigration Act of 1924 placed restrictions on the flow of new arrivals. The 1924 Immigration Act, for all intents and purposes, eliminated immigration from Asia. Um, so it meant if there were immigrants here, they were likely going to assimilate into American society. It's very hard to keep your cultural practices alive if there aren't new people coming. In the 1940s, dozens of buildings in Little Syria were seized and destroyed using eminent domain to make way for the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. Then in 1972, the World Trade Center was built, leaving only a handful of the original neighborhood buildings. Unfortunately, when I moved here, it was pretty much almost a wasteland in a way, because two acts of eminent domain had decimated the neighborhood. But the nice thing about it was that it was really quiet. Esther Regelson moved to the tenement building on Washington Street in 1984, she lived through both terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center. I think that developers just felt it was an opportunity to just knock it all down and start over again. But they 
have no regard for the history and the context. And these buildings give history and context and texture to the city. And if you don't have that, you've got nothing. In the 1930s, the 16-unit building housed people from 30 different countries. Regelson and a cohort of concerned citizens want the tenement building and the community house landmarked. Without protected status, the buildings could be demolished. We've been appealing to the Landmarks Preservation Commission for quite a while now, and they don't take us seriously. They won't give us a hearing. You know, they don't understand the, not just the historical context, but the cultural context. I'm a child of immigrants, and this country gave us something. It gave us a beginning. So we have to honor that, and honoring the memory of knowing where our families came from and how they struggled so we could be who we are today is very important. And if we don't have a couple of those artifacts, the places where they lived, they worshiped, or they, or they were involved in the community, how can we really tell that story outside of what I'm doing with just words and pictures? To view this program and others like it, go to cbsnews.com slash religion and culture.